I think we're going to be small today. Uh, I know there's several people out sick, and of course, being a holiday, there's lots of people visiting other places, so glad you're here. A busy week, isn't it? Um, in preparation for whatever festivities you're participating in. Been busy. So, oh, do you have Yes, I brought some little goodies. Everybody can take one. Last time I did these Epsom salts, everybody wanted more, so I did two dozen of these. But the guy didn't get anything last time, so I did some chocolate. <laughs> oh, and I'm going to put down um, this little flyer. Norma is my best friend in life, and my sister in law. We are starting a ministry starting the first. So if you'd like to know about it, I'm going to leave that flyer right there. Well, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Um, it's called Creating with Gratitude, online on Facebook. It's going to start January 1st. A lot of just encouragement, some Bible text on the subject. And then we'll always have a creative um, card class that's free on that site in the files. Okay. All you have to do is sign up for that Facebook group. And then we're trying to find somebody who will maybe do a Zoom Bible study once a month on the checks for the month. On that person yet so if you know somebody who likes to do that on the zoom for that group and so just a little pretty self-explanatory but this is norma right here hey, norma. My brother-in-law rex Hi, Rex. Hello. glad you're here thank, thank you. you so we uh just a couple updates on prayer requests carol um codes shipment is back from the hospital in birmingham she was in the hospital for three days in Birmingham. Uh, she's back, but both Gordon and she have very severe COVID. Oh, yeah. And uh, Carol last night was running a temperature of over 104. Mm -hmm. uh, with some cold treatments, they were able to get it down about 100 the last time I talked to them around. So, um, hopefully they will be improving. Uh, the Durst granddaughter, um, JJ, uh, we can expect that she's going to be in chemotherapy for probably, uh, but we'll be in the hospital for at least a month. So, uh, yes. I just talked to Sherry, um, and yes, JJ will have um, three more weeks of intensive treatment, and at least, filming as of then, it would be, she would be able, she should be able to go home at the end of those additional three weeks. Yeah. And then for probably two years of treatment. Three, two years. So we're going to be praying for JJ for a long time. Yeah. So, yes, that, let's hold them up in prayer. And Paul Musgrave is doing better. The last I heard from him, uh, from her, from Barbara, she, he's doing better, but still suffering with quite a bit of pain. Any other prayer requests that we ought to consider morning or be reminded about? Okay. We're stepping back today in our story in, in Jesus' life, and we're going back to some of the stories around uh, the Christmas, uh, around Christmas, just because it is Christmas. So uh, this week we will be visiting. I hope you have been in those passages of scripture. And then we will next week be looking at the four incidences where angels show up in the Christmas story. So I hope that you're much into scripture and enjoying a renewal and perhaps seeing in a different way the Passion Week, which we have been, you know, studying. But let's start our time with prayer. Holy Spirit, we cannot come to your word without um, you teaching us. We long for your discernment, your wisdom. Lift us up into your presence through the study of your word. We sing together. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful 
to the stories of uh, this week's a lesson, but I want to start uh, in our passage in Luke first, uh, and I'm sure you have all studied this stuff, so um, I'm hoping that you will enter into a lively discussion. So we are looking at what the reaction of the different individuals, the different characters in the Christmas story was to the announcement of Jesus' arrival. And so let's start first with the stories of the shepherds. Uh, Luke 2. Now, what do you know about the shepherds? Historically, what do we know about the shepherds? Who were they? What's your picture of them? Go ahead. Shepherds are among the lowliest of society. Okay. Okay, they're lowly in society. What else do you know about the shepherds? They didn't get baths very often. <laughs> <laughs> Lived in the fields, didn't they? Okay, what else? They owned the sheep. They were very concerned about them, really good care of them. If they didn't, they would run away. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but that's the managers. The actual shepherds, uh, they cared about them too, didn't they, Ken? Yeah. Okay. If you could draw a picture of them, what would they look like? Nomads. <laughs> nomads. Okay. So, nomad dress. <clears throat> oh. Dark skin and weathered. Dark skin and weathered. Okay. Multiple layers. layers. Pardon? Multiple layers. M multi especially because they have to sleep outside, huh? Yes, yeah. sleeping on the ground, many of them. Probably their clothes were fairly dirty much of the time. Hands and face might be too. They carry a staff. They carry a staff. Do they carry a staff? Okay. What if I told you that they were kids? What? They were kids. Yes. 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 Remember David when his father Jesse calls the sons together to be anointed by Samuel and goes through all this line of brothers, and Samuel says, Isn't there someone else? And it was David. And he's out in the field, 
he had he was less he was 13 or less he had not gone through bar mitzvah yet and therefore was not considered a legitimate son most shepherds were boys little boys yep perfect sense to me because I, I hadn't thought about that before. We lived in Africa. The little boys were the shepherds. Goats and sheep. And they weren't very big. They didn't wear a lot of clothes, even in wintertime. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at this story here in Luke in the light of the fact that these are most likely little children. Luke 2, beginning in verse 8. That night, the night Jesus was born, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel assured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior. <laughs> Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped, snuggled, in strips of cloth, laying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the Shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart that change your picture knowing that they were probably children what's happening here they're curious and she said they were curious but it also gives us the understanding that i think these kids had sat at mom and dad's knee and knew prophecy y yes they did Find the energy that uh, God chose these young people to be the announcers of the life. And ironically, some of them were not listened to. Right. What's that say? What's that say about God? Out this event. Um, the uh, children were not yet steeped doubts and things about who the Messiah was going to be, what he was going to be, and probably more open to hearing about a very new thing in thought for them as compared to the even of the angels. <laughs> Thinking of Luke 10. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou these things from the and through babes and then he, you know later on he said unless you become like little children or you become childlike accepting and open and receptive i mean it's astonishing go ahead Ted. that was when it said before the session come in and a little child will leave them I'm not sure about the second coming part, but yes. 
yeah. towards the end of time. Yeah. I think we just found a website that said a large percentage of the were young girls. Yes. So if these were girls, it would be even more astounding that God would first be predestined as an even lower society than boys. He would have gone to the very lowest of society. I mean, to me, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's already being born in the lowliest of places. So imagine that he would announce it to the high courts and yet come to the stable you know the, the, those two stories don't go together um and even when the wise men were coming from afar like okay well surely these people are going to know about this and, and be able to tell us they found ignorance no one really even was paying attention to any of these signs so it wasn't anybody really receptive i think god chose the only ones that were the captive audience I mean, can't you just imagine the excitement of these kids seeing first an angel, period, but then a whole choir of angels? That's just astonishing. And they immediately go, We're, let's go and see this. We, we got to see this. Okay, let's look at the other stories here uh, from Luke. Let's look at Simon. What is his response? Um, what is his reaction to the news? Um, so that is in Luke 2, 8, uh, and this is uh, eight days later uh, after Jesus' birth, because if you remember, uh, the baby was brought to the temple to be dedicated on the eighth day, to be circumcised and dedicated on the eighth day. And um, so let's pick up the story in verse 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simon. He was righteous and devoted and was eagerly waving, waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. What was Simon's reaction? Pardon? Praise. Praise, okay. I'm like, okay, how did he know that was? Okay, so who was he believing or what was he believing? He would instantly know that that was not going to happen. Well, you noticed in the text that it says he was righteous and devoted, was eagerly waiting for the Messiah. The Holy Spirit was upon him and revealed to him that he wouldn't die that day. That very day, the Spirit led him to the temple. Directed by the Spirit. And why? Obviously, a man who's daily. Hoping Stanley. So incredible excitement, but maybe even relief. It's like, finally, you know. I've been waiting for this all my life, and here it is. Such relief and voice. Fully embracing that moment, isn't he? Just in looking forward to it, in thinking about it, planning, hoping. Yes. Okay, going down a little bit farther. Let's look at the story of Anna, verse 36. Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Benel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. He came along just as Simon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. 
He talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly to rescue. What about Anna? Recognize he was for his life for his salvation. He was praying for him. He beyond what the Jews did that it was for all people. That it was. I mean, at that time they had Simeon seemed to have the whole picture. Jesus to come for the self. That's what she was doing when she she wasn't living just for herself. She was praying for the that we spend a lot of time praying about ourselves, our loved ones. And for those who don't know the Lord, they will get to know the Lord. I think our prayer sometimes. So, what kind of woman is this? Think about it. If you had somebody living here at the church day and night, what would you do? Huh? She was poor. She, okay, she could have been poor. Okay. We consider him a little crazy. We consider him a little crazy. Yeah. Moocher. A moocher. Okay. What was her reaction? Her reaction. To this her news. Was her age. You know, she probably was very respected and. As she was there, she was known to be probably very iconic. Like, yeah, that's the, Anna. She's the one from the church. So if she says something, we should listen because we know she's devoted. Okay. Because of her age, I think people. Yeah, well, scripture names her as a prophet. So, you know, there must have been something about her that gave her a voice, gave her authority. Yeah. What's respected. Well, what was her? Go ahead. Both of these individuals were looking for the Lord. Right? In many ways, much of the society at the time were looking for God. Therefore, they were attuned to what message was coming through to them. I wonder if we are doing the same. They, so. There's an intensity about both Simon and Anna, isn't there? A, a hopeful expectation. And they must have been steeped in scripture to be, you know, aware. Yeah. Yeah. You say she, her parents had died? Oh, she, her husband had died. Her hus, uh, she was married seven years. Her husband had died. What I was going to say is that someone who is in that environment over time for those people had to have had quite a reputation of being committed, seen as being a servant of God, like the priest in many ways. I, think. I see her as having great authority in that community. Well, we did. So let's look at a contrasting Let's go back to Matthew 2. So we have three groups of people or individuals uh, here that are anticipating and hopeful and joyful in their anticipate, uh, anticipation of Jesus coming with his birth. Let's go back to Matthew 2. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands 
arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star that had seen they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. <clears throat> when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it's time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Well, let's look at each of these characters in this dream. I mean, in this uh, story. So, who's Herod? What do you know historically about Herod? Very evil. Very evil. Okay. Examples. Of people that got in his way. Yes. Family members. Yep, his wife, his two oldest sons, and the other things. He was kind of known as a paranoid uh, guy. You know, anybody suspicious of taking control, he he's out, out to do them in. He's got his position through bribery. Okay. You know, paying for it. Okay. His father also had done a favor for the Roman government, which allowed him, which gave him some privileges, too. Yeah. What else do you know about Herod? Wasn't he the one that married his brother's wife? Uh, no. That, that's the next Herod. Yeah. There's many Her Herods there. So what else do you know about Herod? So he knew that people didn't like him. And at the time of this story, Herod is probably in his 70s, uh, you know, maybe 70 years old. He knew people didn't like him. So when he's on his deathbed, he asks that all the nobility in, in Jerusalem be arrested and put in prison. And the day he died, they were to be executed. And the reason for that was he knew that no one would be crying about his death, and he wanted the whole city mourning. So he, you know, literally planned to kill all these people. I don't know from history whether or not that actually happened. I know he actually arrested them. I don't know if they actually got killed. I think at least 70 priests were killed. 70 priests. Uh, uh, Israelite priests, uh, 70 priests were killed. You know, he was a despot, you know, he just arbitrarily would uh, destroy anyone. So what is the threat to him when these gentlemen from the East come? What is the threat? He sees him as a new king. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Now, do you know that one of Herod's titles was King of the Jews? Herod, one of Herod's titles was, so when they're asking, you know, about a new King of the Jews, what's happening to his anxiety? It, you know, it, it's going off the roof. Okay, so that's 
kind of thing. But what happens to go ahead? Herod Jewish? No, he was Edomite, which is neighboring country. He was not. So notice Herod's reaction. Okay. Why would all the people in Jerusalem be upset when he's frustrated? And the word means highly agitated. You know, that's the original. He's highly agitated. Why would the people in Jerusalem be upset? Okay. <clears throat> if mama's upset, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> there's nobody happy. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other thing that would create anxiety or fear among the people of Jerusalem? Anything that you're aware of? Go ahead. I'm just thinking that the Father's spirit on him, any bit of light in his book. God was trying to do something, and that's just a guess, but I am looking at but the wise men, because about who these people, he got really upset when the wise men didn't come back, and it's, so I may not be connected here, but the wise men from the east were philosophers. They were from, the Greek, belonged to a large, influential class that included Noble birth comprised much of the wealth and learning of their nation. Among these were many who imposed on the credulity of the people. Others were upright men who studied the indications of providence and nature, who were honored for their integrity and wisdom. Of this character were the wise men. These men are totally opposite to her. So let's talk about to the wise men. We have lots of impressions about, about who they are. We have lots of legends around, around who they were. The, the scripture just refers to them as wise men from the East. So any other, any other references that you can remember in scripture about wise men? Job was the wealthiest. The pardon? Job was the wealthiest of the men of the East. Okay. Okay, so Job. Okay. Um, so here's where witness came, passed down. The story of Job was probably not only in the Jew. Heritage that's passed down verbally, it was probably in their heritage too. Okay. Yeah. They were probably either astrologers or murderers. Because they were watching the stars and studying them and looking for from the stars. This was a new star. Makes me wonder whether it was a supernova. Yes, that's one of the one of the uh, projections about that. So let's talk about the Magi, uh, as we've often referred to them. They were very familiar and steeped in. Jewish scripture. Yes, they were. So how did that come to be? Think about other wise men in scripture. Where do we have a reference to other wise men in scripture? Huh? Pharaoh and Exodus. A bunch of wise men. Okay, yes. Daniel was part of the cycle. The what? Daniel. Okay, Daniel. Yes. Yeah. So wise men were this group of counselors who surrounded a ruler or a king. Um, these wise men are from the east, most likely from Persia. Uh, it, you know, the song says the Orient, but most likely they were from Persia. Um, Babylon, you know, what is now Iran, uh, you know, territory. And these were people who had a long historical history, uh, just like the Jewish uh, priesthood was inherited. The Magi or the wise men were also 
It was their inheritance that became, that allowed them to be part of this class of people. So this, this group of people, we don't know how large they were, but were counselors to the ruler. The, so like you see with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, what happens when Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he can't remember it, or at least he says he can't, and uh, he wants an interpretation. What does he do? Yeah, you want to look at that? Daniel 2. Let's go back to Daniel 2. So Daniel is the one that mentions wise men more than any others. So, um, so Daniel 2, opening verse, um, one night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, the magi, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers, and he demanded that he tell them what he dreamed. And you remember the story, they can't do it. Um, you know, uh, so the astrologers replied to the king, no one on earth can tell the king his dream and no king, however great in power, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter or astrologer. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream and they do not live here among the people. Um, so then, remember, Daniel came and rescued them, and he was considered one of these groups of people, but he wasn't in that meeting, uh, but he intervenes uh, with Ariok and uh, stays the ex ex um, execution of these individuals. They owe Daniel their life. And Nebuchadnezzar makes Daniel over them, over all of these things. So how much of influence do you think Daniel had in, historically on this group of people? My hunch is significant. Because he, you know, they're using language that comes out of Daniel and other biblical stuff. So I can imagine that uh, Daniel took them back to Numbers. Want to look at that passage, Numbers 24. And here we have the story of Balaam. Remember, Balaam goes and he curses uh, he, he's invited by Balak to curse the children of Israel, and he uh, never is able to do that, and Balak gets really upset at them. But in the midst of these blessings that he uh, places, um, I have totally lost my place here. Uh, he places... Um, When you switch Bibles, you know, you forget where. Sorry, I, I can't quickly find it. But anyway, Balaam is uh, Balaam is the one who says a star will rise out of Judah. Verse 17, thank you. Um, <coughs> not verse 17. A star will come, come out of Jacob. Yes. Verse 17. Yes. I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the heads of most people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheba. So... Daniel probably took them to that passage of scripture. These, these men are devoted to understanding these prophecies that are part of their heritage, things that have been passed down from centuries. 
and they are looking. So when this star rises, Ken suggests that it was a, a supernova. Have you ever seen a star hanging over a house? Yeah, man. <laughs> yes, you can't. We've seen them for some time. Yes. Where do we see in Scripture a light moving? Moses. Pardon? I mean, it was more fire, I guess. Yes. Moses and the Israelites. Yes, but if the Shekinah glory moving. About, you know, Ezekiel talks about the Shekinah glory moving from the holy place to the east side. Is it possible? I'm not saying it is, but is it possible that it could be actually the Shekinah glory directly correcting those and where they were? They're exceedingly excited about this. Go ahead. You asked where, if you'd ever seen a star hanging over directly over a house. Uh -huh. That happens if you're in the right place looking at the right house. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, good illusion, <laughs> huh? Yes. Okay, so go back to our, our Matthew passage here. So here are these uh, dignitaries going up in Jerusalem and my hunch is they're expecting the whole community knows about this. And they're asking, where is, where is, where is? But they finally get a private audience with Herod. And what does Herod do? <clears throat> what? Very interesting. He's, he's interested. What does he immediately do? He turns to the priest, and what do the priests do? Do you notice they don't go back and pull out the scrolls? Lisa doesn't say that. They immediately cite Micah 2. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. What is the Jewish leader's response to this announcement? Savior has been born. What's their reaction? They knew the prophecy. They could quote it. Yep, and they they knew it. But what did they do with this announcement? Ignored it. They didn't do anything. They, they did absolutely nothing. They knew the scripture, and these people are saying, "Star has risen. We've come to worship him." And what do they do? They don't walk out of their homes and go check it out for themselves. They don't go down to Bethlehem, which is less than five miles away. They don't do anything. These are heathen who came. Why would they want to listen to them? Okay. Exactly. Have any respect. Agile. They miss the fact that they were supposed to show So when people came and asked them questions, they answered their questions. They weren't interested in sharing. So why do you think they're, why do you think they, besides that, that they, they're not going to interact with these heathen, why do you think they don't do anything about it? Huh? Well, they were insulted that, at the thought that God would speak to someone else because they were convinced that they were the cat's meow and, and God would only come to them. And, and if some heathen came and said he thought this was being fulfilled, it's like, oh, no. 
not happening. It's possible they were afraid for their lives. Oak this, and Herod would kill. Okay. Yeah, it's good. It could be. Okay. They probably felt like they were caught with the pants down, and they didn't want to validate part of it. Didn't want to call any attention to. <laughs> yeah, like by acknowledging it, you know, when people would start, oh, where is this king? They want to keep it on a down road. <clears throat> well, it said that all of Jerusalem, they were glad to point the finger. So now it's not searching for somebody in Jerusalem. They're in Bethlehem and look. And in Bethlehem was a small town. It was to be sacrificed for the better good. Well, and if you truly believe you are the chosen one, why would you think that God wouldn't tell you personally? That's not the point. But they're not even curious, though, about the star, are they? It, they're not even curious. The story. I've misinterpreted the Old Testament the wrong way and was expecting. So Herod basically sends them on their way. I want you to notice when the when the uh, Magi, the wise men walk out of Jerusalem, what happens? There. The star appears again. The, the star appears, and what's their reaction? What? What verse are you on? Verse 10. Overjoyed. Yeah, extremely excited. I, I mean, this is like... Um, Beyond joy. You know, the scripture could have said they've been really happy. But no, the word is extremely excited. They are so excited to see this star um, again. And, and so they, despite the experience they had in Jerusalem, they're still anticipating something super They entered the child and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped. Bowed down. That word. Go ahead, Bob. Well, is, is there anything in Scripture that says that anyone else saw that star besides them? I can't. I can't think of any. I, I don't know if that means one way or the other, but they might have gone out and looked. I don't see no star. Uh, and it's also surprising that Herod, being so upset, did not send any of his soldiers either knowingly and or by secret to follow them. I mean, if you were really upset about it and you wanted to get down to the bottom of it, wouldn't you send your little spies to follow the Magi? Sort of surprises me that he didn't. I think he's trust. He's got to be trusting. Yes, he's the come back. Did the wise man come immediately? After the birth, we suspect it was eighteen months to two years okay. because it's uh, it's he's referred to as a child in that. Yeah, so we don't know. Um, well, that's what I get out. Yeah, because he's a child. Uh, the other thing that we. Most likely, they didn't come on camels. They most likely came on Arabian steeds because that was the means of uh, transportation. So they mainly would have come on steeds. And it wasn't, we know it wasn't three. It was, you know, it could have been as many as 12 wise men along with their entourage because so it would have been a huge, huge Of course, we don't know because all we know is a reference to the wise. 
there enough time that they now lived in a house? It's in the house where they were. So they were no longer in the house. And it takes some time to travel the distance they have. Yes. And it also says that Herod uh, ordered everyone to it. Yes, so he. Yes, yeah, yeah, so he's asking them, when did the star appear? Yeah. Uh, Ken was sharing with me something about the manger in the stable this morning, and I would like, Ken, if you wouldn't mind sharing it just briefly. Uh, briefly? Yes. I don't know if I can do it briefly. <laughs> the, the book I get this from is a book by Jesus from Middle Eastern Eyes, and I found it fascinating. I would recommend it for who wants to have a thrill and a different view of it. But the depiction is basically that the Israeli house really had the cattle in the house. They were at a lower level and they would eat out of the manger that was at the same level as where the family was living. And so that when they came, Joseph and Mary, she's pregnant, People are going to be concerned about taking care of her. Even goes on today in many areas. Pregnant women get all kinds of privileges along the line yeah. and cared for. So they go into a house, possibly a relative. Uh, Joseph is of the royalty, being a descendant of David. So he's treated a little bit special in the city of David. So we go, they go into the house. Now their baby is born, is placed in a manger. It never says they were in the stable. We have interpreted that because it says in the, uh, put in the manger, manger. So they are then there. Now later on, go back to the Greek words, the, uh, in that it is referred to is really a <clears throat> more of a guest room in the, in the in the home there. So when we get down to now, when the wise men come, they are uh, now they said this in the, in the home, and they've been in the home. They're probably still living with the family. Guest room uses a word that is the same word used for room that was used for Christ for the Last Supper. That's typically a room added to a home, not a commercial inn. But when it says they were the inn was full, the inn, the guest room of the house was full. It makes reasonable sense. And the wise men could come any time thereafter, up until probably a few months before Herod died. Herod was a sickly old man at that point. So it, for me, it explains a lot of the features around this that have always puzzled me. Yeah. So you get the picture here where the, the cattle are actually... And the cattle are actually providing heat in some respects for the family. So, so we don't know, we weren't there, but based on um, so the manger, the place, the manger being where the cattle feed uh, is, you know, up here on this level, cattle here and the family there. So it changes our picture a little bit, doesn't it, of what actually may or may not have happened. Would we act any different today? God sent a message and it came to a Baptist or a Presbyterian. Good question. Would we ignore it? Or would we... Good question. What do you think? I'm not sure it's addressing his question at all, but uh, whether they were in a barn or rather in a house is kind of fascinating, it's fun. But the one thing that does not change is what was Jesus doing and where was he talking 
nine months before that. In heaven. That doesn't change. It is an astonishing story that the DNA of the Godhead has been reduced to an embryo inside of a woman's body. And is being born to right, splayed legs of a woman nine months later. It, it, I mean, that, that's astonishing. Just, how does that happen? I mean, that's the marvel of the whole story. Thanks for bringing that out, Rob. Yeah. But I think, Ted, you're moving to where I would like us to talk about. We are anticipating the second coming. Right? I'm just going to go back to what you said. Yeah. You know, we know that the Book of Life was written before the foundation of the world. That means that every individual that has their name there was seen by God before creation was even started. Being that Christ came and was Michael before, and now he is uh, Jesus. He is part of what God wants us to be. Of his control over the creation. Oh, and his loving time. All of these things. Gets us into a whole another discussion, doesn't it? <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that my you know, my thought is fully developed at this point, but I'm going to try it. Yeah. <clears throat> now, you said just a second ago that we are anticipating the second coming, and that is the focus of the church. That is the message that we have for the world. But some of our friends who are Presbyterians and the other folks don't have that same focus. Their focus is Christ's grace and his, his forgiveness, his mercy, and what it means to live a Christian. And, you know, I'm a lifelong Adventist, and I've heard about the second coming all my life, but I don't enough for me about what it means to be born. It means to live daily under God's grace and his judgment. So I just wonder focus, you know, of the wise men and the focus of the priest different. Somewhere we need to marry those two second coming and Because eternity is now, not something that we're going to graduate to. It starts now. And so, how has my life changed because today? Not just what am I anticipating. Anyway, that's my thought. So, that's a good question, too. How has your life changed as a result of this story? <clears throat> Me too, that one of the things that bothered me a lot, Adventists seem to talk about getting ready. And that's not really what it says. It says, be ready. Always be ready. It goes back to accepting that grace and saying, yes, I take that. Well, we'll cover that God has done this for me. I'm, I'm okay. Well, I need to follow him. Do what he has suggested that I do. Emphasize the Sabbath and other things to an extreme rather than treating my fellow man directly. I'm doing things for God rather <clears throat> than for myself. Bible study by a lady who studied um, 
under a Jewish rabbi who's funny rabbi who believes in Jesus Christ as the savior of the world and as the prophet Messiah. It was very interesting because she concentrated her effort on talking about what Jesus preached. What he preached when he went into the synagogue where he grew up was that this prophecy has been fulfilled in your eyes. This is the year of the Lord's favor. And she brought out the point, the year of the Lord's favor is not a span of years time. It is the, it is the time between his first coming and his second coming. How blessed we are live in that time frame because we can not only look back Jesus being here on the earth, but we will look forward to him coming again. And she said, you don't, we don't even understand what it's not like to live there because the people prior to Jesus' arrival were always looking forward, looking forward. They had nothing to look back to to say, God has done this. He's saved us already. They were always having to look forward. And we can look back and we can look forward. And so the year of the Lord's favor, if we even comprehended it to the least, we'd be so excited that we would want to tell everybody. We would be having the response of the shepherds and the, yes. and the wise men. Yeah. Through my Bible study, I've come to that God's grace is not the typical definition that I've been taught all my life. God's grace, actually his power. That means it's his power working in us to change us. Us doing the power working in us to change us. It's not him standing between us and God and saying, oh, look at me. That makes it look like God doesn't love us and can't see us. God loves us. Our, but gives us his power to change us. That's his grace. <laughs> Said that bring his kingdom. His kingdom is here. So the question that I ask myself often is: Am I living a kingdom-like life? Am I living in the kingdom now? What does that look like? How is it different from not being in the kingdom? So he came and he turned religion upside down. He turned everything upside down and said. This is what it looks like to live a kingdom life. You will be able to have that life. It's not something coming. It's here, and I sometimes that I don't embrace it. Living grace fills given life. to my mind, the issue of being self or selfless. I look at self as being something to be born with. It's evil. And most of our life, trying to have a great life with great wealth and things like this, that's where our focus is. I consider it to be a delusion of faith. The language of the Holy Spirit, which we are given at the beginning of our spiritual journey, is selflessness. We're willing to change from being selfish to selfless. I believe we hear the Holy Spirit change and become. So one of my concerns is for us as Adventists is that we focus on the second coming and all the signposts along and I've, I've even heard people say, well, Jesus can't come yet because, and it lists all these things that have not yet happened. Therefore, he can't come. And they forget the text that says he'll come as a thief in the night. You know, and... And so I'm, I'm wondering if we're not a lot like the Jewish leaders in the sense of, oh, yeah, he's supposed to come in Bethlehem. Uh, yeah, there is supposed to be a star. Come, you know, but they're looking at all these things, but in their legalism, their self-righteousness, that they're actually missing the event. 
<coughs> you know, is that possible that we're so focused on the signs and doing it right, not living the life of grace, you know, as Stanley has brought out too, you know, that we're, we're focusing so much on these things that we're not anticipating, we're not looking, you know, Simon, the shepherds, and Anna, they're all looking, the shepherd, the uh, wise men, they're anticipating this event and are just so filled with joy when they see the slightest thing that indicates he's here, he's here, Ted. Uh, have you ever heard the phrase that we have the truth? Yes. You think there's any smugness that goes along with that? Perhaps. Do you think there's any saving grace in that great knowledge of truth? No, look at the, I mean, it, just in this story, what about and the leaders? What are we going to reject because we have the truth? That just doesn't have it? This mechanic doesn't have it? Yeah. Well, you know, I will, I will put myself in a camp that enjoys the teaching of other denominations. <laughs> Stanley. Um, we sometimes look you know, at the Christ child, but we don't look for the God of Christ child. We look at it. That's a nice story to look at. But there's a difference between that, I think, and really looking for what God is doing for me in that. Gift of that for me, grace that comes from, from that lowly they're seeking the Savior, you know, and if you seek him, what's the result? <clears throat> You'll find him. We are to pray that kingdom earth. Who, who can be now? And, and through my grace, his we can become like him now. And that <laughs> heaven coming to earth is God coming down or within us to start living a life of other centric, which is what heaven is all about, is an other. And the second coming for people for the last two thousand plus years has really been at their death. Has been at their death. Right. Yeah. Being prepared for the second coming. Being prepared for the day we die, which can be at any moment. Well, it's past time for us to close our together. I hope this perusal of a few passages of scripture has brought you closer to embracing with joy the fact that Jesus came to earth and he his ear with us living among us. Lord, we are grateful that you came. Not only want to look back at these stories, but we want your presence alive and well every day in our Bless us in the place where we you know our need, our need of a Savior. We need Lord Jesus. Roy, you've got a minute. Don't forget the gifts on the back that Lynn left for everybody. I don't know. I see the people that books.